just invite you to take a deep breath in and to relax around that breath and simply allow yourself now to relax in your seat, adjusting your body in a comfortable position, a comfortable way of being. As you breathe deeply and fully, let us remember that we are truly in the presence of pure being in every moment, that peace is our nature, that love is the way, and that in each and every moment we have choice to begin again, to go in a different direction, to stay the course. And so as we open to whatever is before us, let us know that we always start in a place of steady lift, upliftment and energy right where we are, right in this moment, right at this time. And so we are ready and feel our connection to community in this room, beyond this room, on live stream now, and in every soul that will be watching this service to come already, their presence is here, your presence is here. We are one. And so it is. Amen. Welcome to Wednesday night satsang. It's so good to be here in community and just really feel each other's energy here in this space. We'll move into our time of chanting now. And this first chant has some movement to it. So if you'd like to, you're welcome to join with me and just mirror me. into your body as well as your Thank you. 
so we shift into our time of meditation, closing our outer eyes and becoming present to the breath. Breathing in and letting go. Breathing in peace. Exhaling stress. Breathing in beauty. Exhaling suffering. Exhaling tension. As we settle into the breath and this time apart, noticing whatever is going on in the body in this moment and lovingly supporting the body the balanced seated posture, bringing gentle attention to anywhere in the body where you may be feeling discomfort. Breathing into that area, feeling ease. Allowing lightness. And a compassionate inner awareness of your experience. Today you have walked your spiritual path. And there have been many activities experiences that have arisen, shown up, and now those experiences have passed. And you are present now to this experience that has arisen an opportunity to be with yourself as you are, to experience the light of your inner being, and acknowledge and affirm yourself right where you are for all that you have walked through to be where you are in this moment. To acknowledge your walk of faith that has brought you through dark times and has affirmed you in joyful times and has held you in the most delicate times. Knowing that right where you are, right now, is perfect just as it is and is ripe for your healing, it's ripe for your growth, is right for you to step forward into what is yours to do. Seeing yourself living fully, freely, vibrantly, radiantly. that this is God's will for you, for it can be no other than for your good and for your blessing and for your prospering. And 
so allowing that harmonizing energy of spirit to have its way in you in this moment. serves and to hear it, to gain the lesson, to grow. So I invite you now to take some moments to settle into your heart to listen to that still, small voice and hear what it has for you to know tonight. is here and all is well. And it is in that awareness that we live and move and have our being. And so it is and so we let it be. Gently return now to this time and place. Take a fresh breath in, all the way in, all the way out again. And feel your presence seated in the chair you've chosen and the, the softness of your body, the, the comfort of this room, this space. And as you recognize that you've spent some time now and um, out of your mind <laughs> and into your inner self, into the de depths of you, you remember why it is that you come here, why it is you gather, why it is these teachings remind you <coughs> that you are not what you think, that you are really everything else. Thinking is spontaneous action out of it. And so in knowing that, this is an opportunity to feel the gratitude that you may have for the changes that have occurred in your life as you put these things into place. And as you do that, this is our time to share our offering, our gift. And as we do that, we may choose to do it physically and give in this room. We may do it online. We may do it uh, and text to give through our phones, however you give. Please <coughs> let it come from your heart and be blessed by speaking our prayer together. Divine, Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all the good I am and have, all the good I give and receive. And so it is. So it is. Amen. Amen. Why do 
say yes, say yes, ah yes, say yes, say yes, 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 yes. Life is a dance, any way you look at it, all of our life is a dance. Choose your own partner and pick your own song. and giving your all there are rewards for this what I become is in my command I am whatever I wish say yes yes say yes yes say yes yes ah yes say yes yes say yes yes say yes yes yes, yes. yes. That's who you are. Life is a dance, any way you look at it. All of our life is a dance. Choose your own partner and pick your own song. Come now and join in the dance. I know the life. Say yes to life. Dancing with life. I know that when we begin our spiritual path, there is, for many people, this sense of upliftment and bliss and peace, and you just can't stop wanting to tell people about it. I love when those people come and find us at Unity, and they're so excited about the message of Unity. And then as we've been in, in unity or on your spiritual journey for a while, things can kind of level out. And they can plateau and it can feel like, what happened to that joyful dance that was happening in the beginning? Now it feels like the rubber's hitting the road and it's a little more, um, can be stressful or, or tried or te just like even tenuous feeling of, I, I don't feel the presence of spirit like I did. So we're gonna talk about that today. The middle of the journey. This is part of Deepak Chopra's teaching from the third Jesus and how we can dance in the middle of the journey. Have you ever wanted to know how far along you are in your spiritual path? Like, just kind of get a gauge. Like, am I close to enlightenment? Am I kind of in the beginning? Come on, can I just kind of get an idea if I'm really far behind? Give me a nudge or something, and there's that question. How far along really am I? And, it, and it's not discernible by time and effort. But we wish that it could be. In school, we know our grade level. 
And we can say, okay, now I'm in second, I'll be in third, I just complete these assignments and this coursework, take these tests and I'll be in third. The spiritual life isn't, isn't like that. How do we know how much we've evolved? We think the spiritual path is about finding peace uh, or finding yourself or ending suffering. But the path isn't about just feeling better, which is wonderful to feel better. It's not just about that. It's about a profound transformation that happens within. There are teachings, spiritual teachings, that are called translative teachings, which offer you opportunities to change things out in the outer part of your life, which are wonderful. Get the house, the car, the money, the job. That's usually where many of us start on the spiritual path, and where we find a connection to that, oh, I'm getting my life in order, and there's this tr also transformative opportunity that's available where those outer things become less important than your, your awareness of God and the development of God within you. Jesus fully embodied this transformation and this reality. And it's the transformation to God consciousness which Deepak is leading us into through this understanding of the third Jesus as us and that consciousness transforming and evolving in each of us. So here we are in the middle of the journey and towards, it's, the book is almost over. We've got one more week with the book and the Karen's going to, Reverend Karen's going to tell us next week how we ascend. And, oh. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That'll be the last step. <laughs> so our experience after first stepping on the path when we felt the highs of, of insight and uh, awakening, that our experience as a spiritual being becomes more subtle and constant because now we've integrated those energies. It's not like, oh, this is something else I'm experiencing that's different from me. It's becoming you, right? So we recognize that, that we've changed. And our responses to our spiritual growth can have a wide range. And Deepak tells us that they can express in this way. I'm living from the level of my soul, recognizing him. I, I've stopped living from the outer effects or the personality. I'm living from the level of my soul. I don't have much attachment to my ego. I'm finding my own truth, my own truth, rather than the truth that's been imparted to me. I'm discovering it through my own insight and discernment. There's more love in my life, and I'm better able to receive it. I'm changing my old conditionings and my addictions, and now I can remember who I really am. So those are the responses that we have to spiritual growth and how we know ourselves through that journey. And while we can really be eager to progress spiritually, and there can be an expectation, hey, I show up on Wednesday nights, I take classes, I, I come and meditate, or, or whatever your practice is. There's a desire. Deepak says it's not possible to feel that you're growing every minute, that, that you're just not going to feel that every minute you're, you're growing and you're expanding and learning and ascending and, and all that, that it doesn't happen like that, that there are times when we can feel that there's no growth happening, like it feels like a fallow time. And you can lose focus, you can become discouraged. And you can even experience setbacks. And some people even find themselves returning to addictions that they thought they had conquered. And they're, they're, they're finding that a need to return to 12 step that they may have stepped away from. Because there's that, that feeling like, you know, lose, losing track, getting lost, there's a plateau, and maybe you feel like you can't get past it, and so you seek that support to work through that so you can move forward. The middle of the journey has both rewards and frustrations to it. There are rewards and there are frustrations. And Deepak tells a wonderful story to illustrate this, and it's about a very experienced Sufi teacher who had many great spiritual advancements 
until one day he experienced no light at all. It was like the light vanished. And this is how he expressed the experience. And see if you can relate to it. I was sitting at the breakfast table with my wife when the thought occurred to me, who is that? <laughs> you ever think that? Who is that? I love my wife dearly, but at that moment I felt like I was looking at a stranger. I tried to shake the feeling, but without success. For a long time it was quite baffling, because I had assumed that I was making steady progress toward reaching God. But then I realized what was happening. It's like this. You work years to climb the mountain. You're nearly at the summit and you see God's hand reaching down to you, figuratively, of course. Eagerly, you run toward it. And just as your fingers are about to touch God's, God says, have you forgotten something? <laughs> it's a shock because you realize at that moment that you made the summit by leaving behind all parts of yourself that you hate and are ashamed of. You didn't plan to take your secrets with you to God, but that is how it is. You must go back down and find the orphans and abandoned children who are crying in the dark. Not just your best self finds God, all of you does. Feel that, all of you, all those parts that you wish didn't show up and always in the worst moments. Everyone meets resistance on the path, why, why? So Deepak gives us some of the reasons why we meet resistance. One of them is habit. You've just been doing things a certain way you in a relationship and you've come into a way of being with each other and it could be dysfunctional but that's just the way you know how to behave together right and then you have a new experience that tells you a different way to be and it doesn't fit with the old way and your mind resists it because there's a pattern that you've created that you know and you cling to the old ways. So there's habit as one of the ways that we meet resistance. There's memory. Memory can be dangerous because you assume you know everything already on the spiritual path. And so the past, what you know to be true, overshadows the present and you're not able to see the present because you're living from a knowingness of what worked in the past or what you knew to be true rather than what is. Guilt is the third one he gives us, that uh, whatever experiences of your past that lead you to feel a sense of unworthiness can hold you back on your spiritual journey. So there's guilt. You are the one holding yourself back by not loving yourself and releasing that guilt. Self-worth is another one, he says that you can feel that new experiences are too good for someone like you. I went to a retreat once and they were doing hands-on healing and it was very beautiful, it was very peaceful. And w the woman who was next to me got up back in the middle of it and she said, I, I feel too much joy. <laughs> and I was, you, how could you feel too much joy? It, she just felt like she couldn't take any more. A feeling that new experiences are too good. Too good. I can't, I can't take that. And when's the other shoe going to drop? There's repressed anger, sorrow, or grief. And these are old emotions that can show up, and they show up to be healed. And you may have not fully released them, and perhaps uh, this is something that, that I've learned uh, mainly from my spiritual director, Robert Brummett, that your psyche wasn't 
available to heal at that moment because you were still so traumatized. But as you mature and in life, and you're separated some time and space from that event, you become more available to look at it again and to heal it. Otherwise, you push it down again. And pushing it down again, I don't wanna look at that, I hate that part of my life, I hate that parent or teacher or whatever it was, I don't wanna think about that and push it down and that's that repression that causes resistance on the path. Another one is loss of control, that you panic because there is an inner conflict that you know this old way, there's a new way, and you don't know what the new way is going to be. So there's, you feel like you're not in control of the situation, of your life, of your spiritual path. Loss of control. Next is skepticism and doubt. And... Has that ever showed up for you? Like, is this unity stuff really true? Come on. Where you doubt your faith. It's the rational mind that can't grasp that depth of spiritual truth. It refuses it. It refuses to accept your new experiences as spiritual or as deep as they are, as holy as they are, whatever. No, 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 that's a bunch of spiritual hooey. And the last one is victimization, which is a pattern that we can live out where you're just used to disappointing people in life, you expect something bad to happen, and you have low expectations because then there's low risk. If you walk in low expectation, then if something happens, well, oh, I knew that was going to happen. I knew, I, I, I knew not to get my hopes up. So these are all examples that Deepak gives us of resistance. And so it's a huge list, and how do, we, how do we handle it? He says the key is simplicity, simplicity, that when some negative reaction mm -hmm. arises, any one of these or something else, mm -hmm. to simply stop, just be with it, be with it, feel it, notice it. And when you give yourself that time and space to do that, then you're at a place where you can make a conscious choice rather than reacting to it. You can make a choice to do something about it, to seek a therapist, to practice forgiveness, whatever it is, in response to what has arisen, to let it go. So. Some of the choices that he offers are these. He said you could practice patient waiting, which is noticing the negative reaction, being with it, and being attentive to it without any judgment. Okay, anger shows up, I feel it in my chest, it feels hot, it feels fiery, it feels uncomfortable, and it's just a feeling, and I let it be. I, I feel as the heat of it, the presence of it. I, I allow it to be, and notice that when you fee finally just feel the feelings of it rather than the story, you feel the feelings of it, it can move through your body rather than hang into your muscles and tissues. The issues are in the tissues. <laughs> <laughs> Feeling it, and that's, that's one of the ways to deal with an obstacle. Another way is to talk out the problem to the problem. He says just... Any negative experience is just a part of you. It's actually a part of you. It's part of your psyche, your mind, consciousness. So just talk to the fear. Talk to the hostility. Ask it what it means. Have the dialogue. It's just a part of you that got hidden away, that wants to be seen. It wants to be healed. It wants to be heard. And the healing can only come with understanding. Another way is to dialogue, journal with it. Me and anger or fear or revenge, whatever it is that has shown up. And work through that without 
acting it out. That's a practice. It's a practice because it's changing. It's changing you and allowing transformation. You can ask the underlying energy to leave. I really liked this one because you could just have some negativity that's hanging on. You've heard what it had to say. You just ask it to leave. <laughs> Be gone. That energy is just stuck to a message that is in your consciousness. And so listen and then move the energy. And then finally, physically respond to it, which is to move the body. Go take a walk, go to the gym and work out. You can literally just shake your body. Uh, there's a wonderful vocal technique that I studied by a leader in acting voice training called Catherine Fitzmorris and she would have us lie on the floor like in a in baby pose and just shake just shake and it shook the tension out of our voices I I, I, I want to revisit that because it was very good and uh, and release it releases old old energies that we've held on to primal scream easy it's free and powerful. <laughs> I went on a retreat and somebody said to me, they're like, you're holding on to a lot of anger. You got to get that out of your body. Go out in the woods and scream. <laughs> so I was like, are you going to hear me? Or is it going to bother? Nobody, nobody cares. Just go out there. And it was, and I had had a massage and all kinds of things at this retreat, but that scream, uh. just screaming and screaming and screaming. The birds didn't care, trees didn't care, but it made a difference to me because it just got that energy out of my body. It just cleared it out. Residual stuff I had been hanging on to. Toning, which Joshua Nasio will be doing some of that in his workshop coming up on the 15th, is just toning, making sounds, allowing to make low guttural sounds, high pitched sounds, whatever sounds you want to make and feel, allowing it to go wherever you want it to go in the body and let it out and breathing, deep breathing, deep, deep breathing. These are just all physical responses that we can make as choices to respond to the resistance rather than taking action that can be harmful to yourself or others. So these are responses he says don't work. So we can cross those out when we when we show when they show up, okay. Uh, there it is and, and and I'm going to take a different action. Rationalizing. Rationalizing. It's just a mood. I don't have time for this. So it shows up for healing. You say it's insignificant and you, you try to avoid it but it is significant because after all this time it's shown up to be healed so it's significant and, it, and it's worthy to be heard so rationalizing is one way we try to evade that process another is ego so when you have feelings that show up that you don't approve of he says not to say I'm not a person who gets angry I'm not a person who gets depressed. I'm not a person who cries. Whatever that is for you. He says, inside, you are a reflection of the whole world. So all of the human experience, the whole spectrum of that lives in you. So you are, you are that person who feels, who feels that, yes. And he says, rejecting your feelings only makes you numb and unresponsive to life. And so we don't want to walk around that way, being numb. Mm -hmm. And this is an obstacle that you need to remove. <clears throat> Allowing yourself to feel the feelings that you have. Timidity and fear. So negative energies are always connected to a memory and they can be connected to a memory that you had as a child and back when you were a child you weren't equipped perhaps to face the loss 
to face the fear, the grief, the anxiety, the loneliness. At that time, you had coping skills for appropriate for your age, but not adult skills. Now you're an adult. And so when those feelings of timidity and fear show up, Recognize that what you're experiencing now is only a shadow. It's not the thing that was when you were a child. It's a shadow of that. And now you can see it from a different perspective and you have the tools. You have the tools to bring that healing that perhaps weren't available to you in your childhood. And finally, there's procrastination. Because negative energy never shows up at a, at a good time, does it? <laughs> it shows up in the middle of something that doesn't feel like, excuse me, I need to take a spiritual break and <laughs> do a worksheet or whatever <laughs> before I come back to this conversation. No, it shows up at, at, at an inconvenient time. And he says that if you wait until to deal with it at another time, you could take it out unintentionally on someone. And really they're only triggering what's been inside of you all along. And he says the healthiest way really to look at it is that it's all inside of you. It's all going on inside of you. And perhaps they have done something that was wrong and hurtful and in intentionally uh, demeaning or whatever it happens to be but he says it's more productive to face the truth that all of our negative energy belongs to us and not to that person because that's just projecting it outside of yourself and so just really claiming it because within you you can do the work you can't change somebody else we know that we know that we can keep trying we can pray for them right <laughs> and pray uh, and you may notice that they change as you change because we're, we're mirroring each other. What feels like backsliding in the middle of the journey is actually a return to parts of yourself that need spiritual attention. So you can be gentle with yourself on that, that there is something that just needed some more healing and attention and love, that your perceptions are changing. I love how unity minister eric butterworth says that we are spiraling in consciousness and so we so we have let's say family dysfunction we grow spiritually up the spiral family dysfunction again but we're now we're at a higher level and see it differently and we do some healing work and then we move up and we're spiraling upward family dysfunction but we're at a higher level so we just keep learning growing and spiraling upward in consciousness. But knowing that as we're doing that, we keep moving into <coughs> uncharted territory. So it can feel vulnerable. You can struggle with discouragement in that and not, not knowing if you're on the right, taking the right steps. And he says there's a temptation to return to that life that you had before you had your spiritual path whatever that was, when you just didn't know about Christ consciousness and freedom through, through knowing the truth and affirmations and all that, whatever that was, if, if there was that prior in your life or whatever, before you went deeper into your spiritual life or your calling, that you can be lured right back into it because it's known. It's known. He says you're experiencing all the things that Jesus told his disciples about. There's all those things that are in the Gospels that he preached about to allow them to be aware of what was happening in them as they unfolded God consciousness. In the middle of the journey, we exchange our material wants, our fears, our hopes, and our dreams for a single and undisturbed state where non-change is primary. Deepak tells us, non-change. So what does non-change feel like? Non-change is an experience of the mind where it stops being frantic, it stops being restless, it stops being obsessed with people or things. The attachment to material things is less. 
the us versus them stops being such an appealing dynamic to keep living out. Issues of social status, money, and possessions no longer seem important. So that's non-change. And I'll leave you with this. A famous guru was asked if enlightenment could be achieved quickly. And he said, yes, you could do it in 30 days. But only if 30 men held you down. Can you imagine that? If you were held down for 30 days by 30 men. Wouldn't a lot of resistance come up? A lot of opportunities for forgiveness and releasing. So I, I thought that was really an interesting uh, metaphor that he offered us about enlightenment. But that it seems like it, it could if you had all of your stuff come to you in a very quick amount of time, you could reach enlightenment, but who wants all that all at once? <laughs> so there's that thought. The middle of the journey invites us to take a giant leap into the unknown, knowing that the end of the journey is going to look nothing like the beginning that you left mm -hmm. from. Namaste. Amen. Namaste. really that was a, a, a quick run through about 20 years of my life uh, <laughs> right there <laughs> where all the all the uh, all, all the different methodologies and all the different breathing and all of the different sob stories and all that stuff which isn't to say it's over and which isn't to say um, I'm there but I'm not there <laughs> I'm here and I'm just really remembered how much it takes of us, right, to, to, to let go of and to forgive. And I think I'm still stuck with, um, we don't take our best self to God. We bring all those little critters with us, you know, yeah. all of those different ways of being. And that in this life, my practice has become more of recognizing when I can't rationalize it and I can't think it and I, I can't fix it and I can't go solve it and then I realize I it's me I have to live with it and that's when my heart grows bigger and I can just embrace it and just remember its story is not my story anymore you know mm -hmm. the story of this part of me is really here just to be loved not changed not fixed you know mm -hmm. just here and it helps me in a lot of other situations too. Mm -hmm. Only when I've given up on anything else that won't work, that's when I remember. I think this is the thing, you know. Yeah. And I appreciate your referencing our stories. We interact with them as if they're so real, oh. and they're. It's like you said. It's all inside. Um, I, I, I. You've said it before, and I, I was amused the first time I heard it, but. Um, and, and though you didn't actually say it tonight, I, I felt it, that um, will I always be in a state of transformation? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's, it's sort of, we, we have these uh, lofty values associated with transformation. So I don't, I don't want to damage that in any way. I just want to preserve that and let that spin in its own orbit for a moment. And just assert that most of our um, engagement with that idea, though, is rooted on a premise of, i got to fix this, that this is not it, that this has got to be transformed, it's got to be made better. And, um, and I don't think that that's bad. I would go so far as to say it's inherent in the part of me that needs to sleep every day and feed and uh, you know, eat and, and you know, just sort of live, inhabit my human body. I'm reminded of what a good friend of mine says, that it, I'm more like a horse than I am an angel. Now, I'm not a horse, and I'm not an angel, but most of my energy is spent making muck. And, um, that, and my human condition is the gig. You know, it's not like I can... I, I really appreciated what you brought in toward the end about um, non-change. I'm going to 
cling to that as that is, that is our spiritual self that is whole, perfect, and complete, and flawless. It was, it is, and it forever will be. No matter how creative my human body gets with how I interpret my experience, that part is untainted. Um, and, and when I can identify with that part of myself, then my human condition kind of aligns accordingly, but I'm still a horse. I'm still more like a horse, you know, this part of me that has to dance with that eternal oneness that abides within me. It still bumps against other human beings, you know, and it still has these um, experiences of memory and habit and all the other things. I thought it was an action-packed talk. I mean, yes. there was like, yes, it was. wow, there's a lot of information there. But mm -hmm. uh, I also really valued the uh, um, reflection on the continuum of transformation. It is part of our human condition to forget and wake up, forget and wake up, and you know, go take another, another cut at it, different place on the spiral. Thanks, Stephen. There's, there was a lot in that in that one meaty chapter, and he went into more of Jesus's teachings and some pretty difficult ones too, like about him saying you have to hate your mother, your father, your sister, and your brother in order to abide in me. And what is that? I mean, for <laughs> us on our journey was wait a minute. I thought Jesus said we need to love each other, love your love your neighbor, love. Love your enemy, love everyone. And so Deepak was was saying that that that's another shift as far as releasing old ways of being to come into a new way. In order to abide, you've got to not not hate. He was like, well, Jesus spoke very declaratively to make a point. Mm -hmm. He would use strong language, and who knows what. The Greek words were, mm. you know, that were in, that were translated to English, or he spoke in Aramaic and all. Right. But, uh, but that is really that letting go of the old way and coming into that new way of spirit, and and detaching from the 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 need of certain dynamics and even dysfunction and that kind of thing that he. He explains our, our human ways of being and that there's there's a higher way but yeah that I love that image of, of the more more like a horse <laughs> we keep getting in in the muck and that's and then we take that all as Karen was saying we take that all to God all the muck <laughs> like God is the whole spectrum of light and darkness we try to say well God's this here like all of it uh, and so that can be hard to fathom, I think. Right? That's all. I, I think the chapter is also very pragmatic. You know, it gave, you, you shared tonight, very specific tools. And, um, and everybody, of course, has their own experience of what you say and what, what we hear is a mystery to all of us. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> what was a resounding moment in, in what you were sharing uh, that, I, that I'm going to continue to um, ponder. And that is that if you've got this one going on, you really need to deal with it. And that is numbing, mm. you know, like avoidance. Um, <coughs> and um, that's, that's confronting. Uh, I, I don't know that I do that, but I think that it would be the most um, insidious, that if you were engaged in numbing, you wouldn't necessarily know. <laughs> so you kind of have to pay attention to the symbols and the signals around you to, to get a better sense yeah. of that. Well, our culture encourages it. Go on the phone, go on the game, go on the screen, yes. VR. Yes. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Get out of the experience. Think something else. Yeah. I was thinking about, um, with David, what you were saying about fixing, you know, yeah. like, like, oh. This is still wrong. I got to fix this, right? You know, like one more, one more thing, one more thing to turn over. And I really identify with that. Um, it was what drove me. Um, my my journey started um, 
when my husband was in early recovery and I was um, discovering what codependency was. Um, and in learning about that, I thought I was the one that was whole and fixed. Mm -hmm. I, I showed up with a blank sheet of paper and a sharp pencil to take notes of how to get him sober and keep him there, you know. And realized that that was in itself the dysfunction and the reason he was stuck someplace, mm -hmm. right? Because I was helping him stay stuck mm. by being in denial and not even knowing it. And so in the waking up of all of that, like I felt like I started below the tabletop. Like if you have an addiction, you can put it on the table and you can see, I'm addicted to that thing right there, <laughs> right? Codependent, it's done with mirrors, you know, it's smoke and mirrors. Mm -hmm. So I stayed below the table, I had to climb up to the table to figure out what it even was before I could stop doing it, you know, or wow. start doing something else. Yeah. And so in doing that, um, I started on a journey and I was driven by that perfectionism mm -hmm. that um, I think we have all agreed that we're all ones on the Enneagram. Am I right about that? I don't know. I, remember. <laughs> I, think, I think all three of us might be. Okay, okay. Um, check it out for yourself. Okay. See, you know, but, but it's definitely that drive for perfectionism. Oh. and. And that um, I, I needed to be better and better and better, you know? It's like when something wasn't right, I had to, I mean, I just, I had great motivation. I didn't even, I wasn't even paying, it, it helped me with my codependency because I wasn't paying any attention to my husband anymore. Now I'm driven to be, get myself together, you know? I'm, I'm a fallen apart, I'm a mess, I'm, I didn't even know this was wrong. And so I was driving in my own process, which actually was a good thing. And that really that drive has really helped me to see that when something is uncomfortable, you were saying, you know, numbing out or whatever, um, I'm not comfortable with the discomfort anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and to the degree, it's like wiggling a tooth that needs to come out, you know, I, I wiggled and wiggled and wiggled and until it would come out and I wouldn't sleep until it because it, I couldn't I couldn't be with it, you know. I need it needed to go, and so the same thing is true. Something is is bothering me. I really want to pay attention to it. I really want to listen. And now I have tools right. mm -hmm. that I've accumulated to do that, so I can return to peace a lot sooner in my life, and sometimes without third party help. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I would hold that out if we're all in a different part of the journey, you know, and and recognize that for yourself you'll slowly emerge into the light where you're, you're really okay. You're, re you're really doing well. And things, are, um, things aren't always perfect and they're not always right, but there's a part of you that suddenly can pivot and can balance and can find another way and, and you know where you can find help. You know, you know, you know who's wiser than you, you know, I think. I, I, uh, I think I have time to make one more observation, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it, it, it dovetails in what you were saying, Karen. Um, I appreciated the um, distinction oh. of uh, one of the tools for coping or for transforming negativity, negative thoughts that come our way, is to simplify. That was useful, and then later, you said something about, and a pitfall to avoid is minimize. Um, I don't think you, and maybe you even use that exact word, but uh, it, was, it was one of the avoidance mm -hmm. techniques, and I thought, now that's an interesting distinction. Mm -hmm. Simplify distinct from minimize. Mm -hmm. That is useful to me, because that's, that's like bite size. I can, I, can, I can apply that in various circumstances and, and really call myself out on minimizing, numbing it. It's like, no, I'm going to just keep this right in front of me here, but I'm also going to do the next right thing, and the next next right thing, and in other words, simplify. And, and I think I, eventually I'll get a, a toe hold at first, and then maybe a stride. Such a rich subject, such a rich presentation of ideas. Thank you. Yeah, true. yeah. Thank it's you. about validating the feeling for being there. <coughs> Right? Yes, yes. Rather than, yeah, invalidating. But you, you have a right to be here. And then, ah, oh, thank you for hearing me and seeing me. 
Children want that, don't they? Exactly. Can, can, can I just bunny um, jump onto that just for a second? I, I, I realize that in my drive to be perfect and to get it all right and clean up my shadow and all of that kind of thing, that my, my greatest healing, I think, has come in recognizing there was a part of me that finally just stopped chasing perfection mm. and just stood still and said, Dead gummit, I make space for other people in my life. They can make space for me. Mm. And I'm just not gonna I'm not gonna clean it all up. You know? Acceptance. <laughs> Acceptance. Exactly, yeah, acceptance. right. I just it but it came up as anger. That's another reason why I know I'm a one. Um, but it came up as anger, but then I just settled into it and, and found that I could also find find compassion, right? Mm. And that I could and that I could see that I that the heart that I had been practicing opening for other people could apply to me. Thank you. Yeah, perfect way to close us out, perfectionist. <laughs> I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs>
lights the way, expands us, completes us, and ultimately fully transforms us. And so in this, we are truly grateful. We say thank you. And so it is. Amen. We know that we are one with all life. And so let's join together in our meta practice as we share our practice tonight with all beings. By the, By the power, power of this practice, practice may, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May, may they know the sacred joy that arises in the space beyond suffering. May they rest in equanimity that there is no grasping or hatred. May they experience the equality of all beings. May my practice be a benefit to all. Namaste. Yeah.